who's pitching what on the Quassette? What shows are selling? How busy are the delegates who've made the trip to Cannes? And what are the hottest trends in factual and scripted formats around the world right now? Telecast, the TV industry news review. It's a MIPCOM special show direct from Cannes this week as I chat with Virginia Mousselet from The Wit, Lauren Baxter from Off The Fence, Samuel Kisous of Pernell Media and Larry Bass from Shinnewill to find out how the first MIPCOM for two years was for them. Plus, I catch up with MIPCOM boss Lucy Smith to get the stats on the week's show. It's all coming up on this week's telecast MIPCOM special. My first guest on this week's telecast is co-founder and CEO of The Wit, Virginia Mousselet. How are you, Virginia? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Very well. Lovely to, to have you on the show. And now we're here at MIPCOM in Cannes and your MIPCOM sessions are always high on the agenda for delegates. It's often the only conference session that many of these delegates make time for. Obviously, all the rest of their schedules are full of the one-to-one 30-minute meetings, but your sessions are always a high point. So at this year's MIPCOM, you're giving two presentations. Tell us about those. So the first presentation is about the non-scripted formats, uh, entertainment, game shows. And um, the second is about scripted, scripted shows, That might become scripted formats, but basically it's fiction. Just before we go into uh, talking uh, about those in a little bit more detail, tell us about the wit and and the background. So where are you based? We're based in Geneva in Switzerland. And uh, actually it started like a hobby for uh, my partner and myself because we were absolutely fascinated by uh, TV programmes around the world. Yeah. So our ultimate fantasy was to read all the TV programs from uh, England, USA, uh, Spain, Germany. And uh, we did that for fun, like a little newsletter in the beginning in our kitchen. And then uh, we, we had no business plan. We had uh, nothing in mind, just having fun and being uh, interesting in what we were reading. And then we started to record on VHS uh, the show's uh, from friends living abroad, and suddenly uh, we send this we send this newsletter to a couple of producers and uh, broadcasters, and um, od- oddly enough, they ask us to become a company to become the wits. Yeah. And now, uh, almost uh, twenty five years wow. after that, we have a real database, we have a real company, we have a, a real IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here at MIPCOM. Can never believe it, actually. Well, I was going to say, you know, you. Uh, I was going to ask you how many years ago that was, but maybe the VHS reference uh, exactly. <laughs> probably gives us, yeah, gives us that idea. So, tell us about your business model. It is we're we're basically a database with newsletter, and uh, we have subscribers that have access to uh, all our. Uh, um, all parts of our database, but also to a newsletter that we send and also to specific reports that they can uh, ask us if uh, they want to uh, research on a specific um, uh, topic or a specific type of show. So it is subscriber-based and uh, and there's all, they can also call, call us uh, for uh, any specific questions. So we're very flexible and we right. like to have real contacts with our subscribers okay. and not just being a screen, a cold screen. <laughs> So your MIPCOM sessions then, are these purpose-built presentations specifically for MIPCOM then every every year? Is that how, yes, how, how does it's it... uh, totally exclusive for MIPCOM. Right. And I do it only here and I prepare my selection thinking of uh, the wide public, uh, wide audience and different audience of MIPCOM. Producers and uh, distribution businesses are always, you know, uh, always talking about what you're going to be presenting. So can you give us a bit of a snapshot of what you're presenting this week? So first of all, in terms of fresh formats. I only take very uh, recent formats, not older than uh, this summer, not not older than two months. And then I I like to um, present shows that that are not the most popular in the country because everybody, all the uh, industry knows them already. But mostly shows that people have not seen or that have been maybe commissioned but not broadcast yet or even paper formats 
which are uh, developed enough to uh, to be a real mechanism, a real format. So uh, this time we were um, we had a lot of uh, dating shows, a, a, a number, an incredible number of dating shows, uh, which is not a, I can't say it's a new trend at all because there have always been dating shows and it's a real very classic type of shows for uh, uh, TV but what we felt this time is you know over the past two years uh, with COVID we were thinking of how to produce uh, in the pandemic uh, um, time how to uh, how to uh, con connect with your viewers uh, do, to, can you can you do a, can you produce with a, a the actors that are uh, can't touch, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so how to produce with new storylines, new uh, narrative, etc. And actually, what I realized is uh, now you want the uh, good old-fashioned, uh, you know, dating shows uh, with fun, a lot of game shows, which is not, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, jumping to another. Um, we want our life back, and in general, uh, we want at the same time we want a fresh start, because we don't want it to be like before. But in a way, we want our familiar space, yes. and that's what we can show. Uh, you know, we, we, we can see this here. So a lot of dating, but with games. So we want to have fun. A lot of talent shows, but with a game. Uh, a lot of guessing games. Very simple. Very simple quizzes. And also something that uh, made us laugh or that was maybe a bit uh, counterintuitive uh, is uh, I, I didn't expect after COVID that uh, you would have so many shows um, that took place in tiny spaces. You have dating show in a tiny house, uh, a competition of builders of tiny houses. Right. You have my tiny restaurant. You have a, a competition best in miniatures. So really, I thought after two years of lockdown, uh, I would expect plenty of adventure shows or, you know, white... The great outdoors <laughs> exactly. and something more and, expansive. Absolutely. And no, you have plenty of tiny spaces. So, of course, it's because, uh, you know, it's, there is a trend of tiny spaces uh, um, in, uh, you know, in... in factual documentaries because it's it's a trend in the, the society uh, with the limited budget to have mm -hmm. the, our own house or maybe a camping car uh, turned into a house after COVID. But still, in television, it's really uh, obvious that uh, you want to have your nest, uh, you want to have your, your small uh, dream of a restaurant that comes uh, in a container. You have a lot of boxes, the likes of uh, a lot of holes, a lot of traps, a lot of mystery uh, uh, personality, hidden singer. Everything is, um, you know, behind a mask or in tiny spaces, and you have to guess, you have to imagine. And so what we're seeing are these formats that are born out of COVID, essentially. We're talking about these shows have been developed and produced under COVID conditions, and now they're coming and seeing the light, if you like. And so it's a new wave of almost COVID programming, if you like. I don't think it's really COVID programming because it shows that people uh, need a link, need, need to be close together. And, and you know, for a, there is a couple of dating shows taking place in tiny houses or, or vans. And actually, it's to start again with love, uh, a tiny house or a van is okay, but maybe after two years, uh, you, yeah. need, you need some more space, obviously. But I don't think it's, it's because of COVID, but it's just our, here at MIP, we're really uh, happy to reunite we're happy to see each other and so maybe it's the same uh, trend that you, you want to have some um, uh, warm contacts with people you yeah. have to have a nest yeah okay that's fascinating and and in terms of scripted uh scripted projects that uh, in your presentation what are you seeing there oh there we we we, we saw a, a a trend that is very strong and, and because when we select uh, we never do showcases we, we watch uh, everything uh, that we have in our database you know day by day and then uh, for fiction it's very difficult to choose because you have plenty of types of fiction which are high quality but what I want in my presentation usually is to tell a story for the non-scripted and the scripted so it's uh, I want to, to tell a story and hear Obviously, we had a trend of fiction with angry women. Angry women against domination. 
and uh, and 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 it was um, uh, you know the the, the most uh, watched uh, the most streamed uh, fiction on Netflix uh, is uh, this Korean uh, show um, the Squid Game yeah. and and we had the impression there was a fight against domination so uh, so that's why we we, we branded this uh, fiction presentation fiction against domination and among all the shows where somebody fights against something you have a lot of women character women lead characters uh, that fight of course against maybe uh, you know a, a violent husband or you know uh, like uh, Angela Black for instance but also women that um, team up together to be friends and very different women and what I thought I, I thought it's funny we have at least four or five fiction from very different places, from Nordics, from uh, the South, from everywhere, with very different types of women that become friends. And I wondered, uh, do the men have the same uh, ability to become a friend with a very different guy? Mm. So maybe that would be for after me become my own reflection. But... Definitely, in this year's uh, fiction, there are a lot, even in Turkey, uh, three women who want to, to get rid of their husbands, and it turns into a comedy. Um, uh, um, a Dutch show that's called uh, Deep Shit, uh, also with uh, two women very different who get into a unplanned crime uh, story. It's with, it's, so it's comedy, it's fighting against domination, and it's, I think, very interesting uh, as a, you know, a, a red line for the fiction. Okay. So miniaturization and close contact when it comes yes. to format trends yes. and also dominant women in scripted. Yes. Okay. Well, that's... Well, not dominant. They were victims, but... They uh -huh, were, they're fighting know, they're, back. They're, okay. It's not authoritarian and dominant women. It's right. uh, women who have been victims... And who say, uh, you know, now uh, uh, enough is enough. Yeah, the fighting back. Yes. Okay, fascinating. How are you seeing MIPCOM then, coming, going up and down the croissette and going into the Palais? What's your experience been so far? A lot of emotion to be reunited. A lot yeah. of emotion, a lot of friendship, a lot of uh, a kind of uh, oxygen, you know. And um, and also, uh, as uh, there, there are obviously less people because, you know, they're no Asian people, yeah. not a lot of uh, American people. It, in a way, you have more time to see each other. And I had a friend uh, uh, who told me, oh, can you imagine, I, I just had a one-hour meeting. It's wonderful, one-hour <laughs> meeting. Oh, it's a, really, and and maybe that is the, the, the new, uh, our fresh life. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we wanted, you know, actually, the, the like I, I saw in the, uh, in the non-scripted presentation, it's not about uh, technology. It's not about adventure. It's just uh, about uh, uh, friendship, uh, emotions, to have fun together and yeah. to have time. And to have time because um, yeah. maybe people are fed up of, uh, uh, you know, back-to-back -back meetings here at MIP and back-to-back uh, -back Zoom meetings maybe. Yes. Or yeah. even worse. yeah, we're living, uh, living our lives in those half-hour compartments yes. across the, the day. But, uh, well, that's that's right. I mean, that's uh, I've certainly heard a lot of people have got a lot of meetings, but you're right. It, it maybe there's a slightly less frenetic yes. vibe. Virginia, thank you so much for joining me. I really thank enjoyed uh, chatting to you. And for anybody who wants to see your sessions, presumably they can watch that on Catch Up on, uh, on the MIPCOM website? Yes, that's right. Yes, All right. A, I think for one month there is a stream. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. It was a pleasure. So my next guest on this MIPCOM special is Lauren Baxter, Head of Acquisitions uh, Off the Fence. How are you? Hi, Justin. I'm really good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, not at all. Great to great to see you. You're now Lauren Baxter. You, you got married fairly recently, didn't I you? I did, right in the middle of COVID, yeah. which was not fun. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we did it and tied the knot. And uh, yeah, now a year, a year on, mental, how quick it's gone. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Congratulations yeah, thank then. Thank you. So how are you finding MIPCOM? Yeah, I'm loving it. I think it's so nice to finally see people face to face, um, people that you've maybe only met on Zoom before or, yeah. you know, friends that you haven't seen for a while. I think there is a, 
a buzz around. People are just just so excited to be in in person, you know, meetings again. Yeah. Obviously, we know it's smaller. We always knew it was going to be smaller. Smaller, but there is a buzz around. I think yeah. it, it feels quite buzzy. And as a smaller distributor on the whole distribution landscape you've obviously made the commitment to be here you've got a team here you've got to stand here um and i guess what what i wondered was do you think the smaller distribution companies who've made the effort made the trip out to can do you think you may be benefiting as a result of physically being here with the big distribution teams not here I mean, there are buyers here, right? There, mm. there are plenty of buyers here. So do you think that's an advantage? Do you, are you seeing that, do you think? I think it's going to be hard to tell as of right now, but I do think we all know there's value in face-to-face. Last year, we all knew we could work remotely, work digitally. Um, so I think the bigger distributors and, and even ourselves, we know we can do it. We know we can work in that way. Um, but coming here and seeing some people for the first time you know, I had some meetings that were, you know, game changers just from meeting those people face to face. I do think you can't put a price on actually having that physical face to face with a client. It's just so different to Zoom. Yeah. And you do pick up other bits and pieces that you wouldn't normally talk about on a Zoom. A yeah. Zoom is quite formal often. Yeah. And whereas the vibe here is quite relaxed and people are really enjoying just chatting and yeah. kind of having a bit of a gossip. Yeah. So it's all those things you pick up when you come to these events that you can't really replace on a, on a Zoom. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's almost an intangible value, isn't it, of being yeah. face-to-face and all of those other sort of added benefits. You go around the corner and see somebody that you didn't realise that was there or yeah. you see, see someone in a restaurant. That yeah, you... I had a few people come up to me today just from sitting at the stand that just saw the stand and I forgot how that does normally happen when you come to these markets. You know, people do pass your stand and they yeah. do drop their business cards in and when you think back to all the meetings that you had that were based on those kind of you know just one off chance that you met someone yeah you know started a whole new you know possible business venture or, or yeah. a new client so yeah you you do forget these little things when you when you don't travel to these events and it's quite pleasant isn't it? the sun's out the oh, sun's out in, I went on the for my out. first lunch on the beach today and I went oh my god I can't I can't I'm so excited <laughs> this is what I've come here for <laughs> exactly exactly so so in terms of we, you're saying it's a, it's a little bit more relaxed and that's something that, that Virginia said uh, when we, we spoke to her for the show that you know some of the meetings have gone into an hour meeting which is yep. much more conducive because we know the half hour meetings actually turn out to be 20 minute meetings or so yeah. people yeah. are late and then they've got to leave for the next one which might be at a hotel somewhere yeah. or wherever it might be. I mean, how many meetings do you have scheduled and are they good quality meetings? Yeah, I think I, I, mean, I think I probably have about maybe 10 in the diary a day. And actually that's probably less than I would normally have because like you said, I did schedule most of them hours. I met a lot of them off the stand, had a coffee. So I thought, okay, it's going to be a lot more relaxed. We'll probably have, you know, you also haven't seen these people face to face for, you know, nearly two years. So yeah those 20 minute half hour meetings was never going to be possible yeah. seeing these people for the first time. Um, but I did notice that it, it got a lot busier towards the sort of last week before I traveled. And so I did sort of make some of them half an hour. Yeah. But I think having that hour meeting just, it does give you a better feeling of just being more relaxed and just enjoying the time you have with that person, yeah. um, which is really valuable. I think, you know, you know, not necessarily here to actually do any proper business but the business is being done with the the catch-up yeah which is doing you know what's well, relationship yeah. building isn't it exactly. it's maintaining and, and rebuilding those uh, those relationships yeah. so you're head of acquisitions uh, of the fence so in terms of content that you're looking to acquire what is doing well off the fence at the moment and what are you looking for more of well i mean so we just for those that might not know us, we do sort of everything in the factual space. So from natural history through to history to science, so people and culture, travel, feature docs. I would say at the moment, you know, natural history for us is something that people know us for, but it definitely is even more important now, especially with, you know, the environment, climate change, you know, solution driven documentaries. I think it's still booming massively. So we're, you know, that for us is kind of um, a key area History is big for us, so maybe ancient civilizations, mystery, unique access. Um, and I've said it before, but also bringing science into that. So, you know, what can we learn about the past? You know, we have a series that we are 
distributing now um, from Impossible um, Factual called The Secrets to Civilization, and it's looking at history from the perspective of you know climate change and how climate actually impacted the growth and the fall of some of those civilizations, mm. which is completely fascinating to me that we're even learning now that things weren't as they that we maybe knew of them at the time. So I think science and history is a big area for us. Unique access, talent is becoming more important, it seems, especially with the streamers. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'd say sort of those are the, the big areas for us at the moment. What are the main titles you're focusing on in Cannes? What are your sort of uh, top priorities to, to, to sell? Yeah, so that's obviously one of the big history titles that we've got. We're also doing another history title with WMR called Royals keeping the crown which is a colorized series um looking back at kind of the the rise and the rebranding of royal families around the world um we are also launching a one-off special called the alternative guide to saving the planet which is kind of a quirky solution driven doc about the ways in which we can all help to save the planet Mm -hmm. um we are also doing um a history series called forgotten front lines um by a company a canadian company called go button media um, we're also exclusively representing Terra Marta Factual Studios. So we've got a number of their, you know, brilliant documentaries, one called Eyes of the Orangutan, um, looking at the pet trade. So, uh, and then we're also doing a, a, a nice sort of lifestyle series, travel series um, with Dan Sharp from Dash Pictures called Fantastic Friends, which has got the two Harry Potter twins fronting it, taking, you know, all of their sort of famous friends around the world going to cool and quirky places and that's something really impressive and you've not even read off any there that's a good that's that's what a salesperson's <laughs> like I'm, uh, that's, that's that's pretty good so what about the buyers and you say you're spending more time with the buyers i mean do you fi- are you finding that the key buyers are here i mean are, are there pre- plenty of buyers well, it's probably more of a question for our sales director stephanie mm. um she sort of manages um well, our global sales and our german speaking sales um, and we've also got Oliver, who's here with me, um, who's our digital director. Is Bo here? Bo, no. I think he's sitting pretty in the Amsterdam office, keeping everything uh, under control. Right. <laughs> I think he's very jealous. He's, <laughs> he has uh, asked to be uh, informed daily, with daily <laughs> updates. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're here. I mean, there are buyers here. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of Europeans here um, rather than necessarily some of the North Americans or yeah. some of the more Asian-focused clients. But there's definitely enough here to kind of make the trip worth worth coming. Good. Okay. Well, I guess that's all you can ask for and uh, at the first MIPCOM back from the pandemic. So yeah. listen, I'm going to let you go. It's about uh, rosé o'clock right now. <laughs> so thank you, Lauren, for joining. It's great to see thank you. you for and me. Yeah, not at all. And, uh, and I'll see you on the croissette. Yeah, see you later. Now, it felt appropriate, as we're in Cannes, to have an authentic and knowledgeable French voice on the show. And I'm delighted to welcome Pernell Media President Samuel Kisous to the show. How are you, Samuel? Thank you, Justin. I'm, I'm great. And I, I hope I will live up to your expectation that I'm knowledgeable about anything. Well, I, I hope so, too. Full disclosure to our listeners, I, I handle your PR. I'm obviously not going to be asking you anything too tricky. But obviously today uh, there was an announcement that was the talk of the Quasset. Vivendi have uh, invested in your business. So congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. So indeed, we've been informing our partners here at MIP of our new shareholding structure and the fact that we are continuing to operate as a, um, a autonomous entity um, working with all our broadcasts and distribution partners around the world and in France. And we're very excited to keep doing what we've been doing with even more ambition. Yeah, and that will presumably mean international expansion at some point. Yes, and international has always been our main focus. And uh, Celine Lehmann joining us earlier this year from Arte Distribution, where she was head of international distribution, Um, So Celine Lehmann joining us is um, really proof of that strategy that we want to pursue. Um, So Celine is going to be working with us, developing those very ambitious international theories that we want to to produce with our partners. Okay. All right. Well, we'll come to talk about a couple of those in a second. Um, Well, actually, why don't you tell us um, a little bit about what you're pitching at MIPCOM this, this year? 
we're you know discussing um, a very wide range of uh, factual series that we've been developing over the past couple of months. We're still very strong on archaeology, so we recently announced um, two major archaeology projects. One is uh, about Ramses the Great in Egypt, and the other one is a major discovery uh, which was made um, in Yucatan. It's about the Mayas. It's about the origins of the Mayas, um, and it's a, it's a big, big um, breakthrough discovery made by an American researcher. So we're very excited about these ones, but we're very diversified as a company. We work on a quite a large range of things. So we also are working on natural history. We are working on history, World War II. It's always very interesting, and we have a new series uh, mixing trains in World War II, which we're really excited about. Okay. Which All right. Well, which we haven't announced yet. Okay. <laughs> you just have. Um, <laughs> yeah. One last thing I wanted to add is um, we're also starting to discuss a new project in the world of scripted, which is one of our new initiatives, something we've been um, starting to develop for the past two years. And then, I mean, COVID made it a little bit more difficult last year, but we're definitely back on track to pursue also those new scripted developments and very excited about them as well. Okay. Just, you know, looking at who's here, and there's obviously lots of French businesses, as you might expect. I don't know whether there's more than there usually would be, or maybe it's because of less American businesses here that, that, that that's maybe a little bit more noticeable. But do you think the French businesses that are here stand to benefit from the fact that there are relatively few US studios here pitching to, to the buyers that are here? I mean, I think we are all really happy to be back. Um, but the truth is, a lot of people are just not here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we were in the process of setting up the meetings, we realized that a lot of people that we would usually meet here were not coming. Interestingly, also, we're uh, here for MIPCOM, but there's also a CAN series at the same time. And so, you know, I was just talking to you about the fact that we're doing also script projects now. Yeah. So, you know, that's why CAN series is also interesting for us. I guess... In terms of the quality of the meetings, um, it felt that people have a little bit more time. So I would say that's the positive side of this. On the flip side, it feels it's going to be a little bit shorter in terms of how long people are staying because it's just not so many people to meet. Okay. So it feels like by tomorrow morning, pretty much everything will be done. Okay, which is the Wednesday morning because yes. we're, we're recording this on, on the Tuesday. So. Traditionally, French TV producers, I think I'm probably right in saying this, that they've been a little bit more inward looking into producing for the French market and maybe not so internationally focused. And, you know, your business and, and Federation, for example, are, are the names that stick out, I think, as French producers that are that are making, you know, the trips to, to the US and, and selling content to US networks and UK networks. Why is that? Why why have French producers not really focused internationally up to this point? How many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, to your point, yes, um, it's true that we, we work uh, very widely with partners in the UK, in the US, Germany, and from other parts of the world as well. We had great meetings this morning also with people from Southern Europe. So... Yes, we've always been quite obsessed with coming up with the right projects that can travel. And I think it all starts with development. Um, if you want to be working internationally, you have to make it a top priority and you need to develop those projects that are viable for international um, activities. So I think one way to answer your question is to say, well, why? Well, maybe they were not focusing on these types of projects, maybe the slots available with the broadcasters, we're not um, helping them to come up with these types of projects. You know, when we developed the Real World Thrones, which was one of our first really big temple series that traveled really well afterwards, it was that kind of thing where for years people were telling us, oh no, we don't have space for these kinds of series. And then after maybe three years of pitching it, then... Eventually, we got it on the air and it was very successful. And then it became 
successful returning series airing in many other countries as well. So I think we, we tried to, to, to create slots that were just not there. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a mix of do we have time slots on the air with broadcasters who are willing to do these projects that can travel? And then within each company, are there people developing these kinds of projects that have the ability to travel? Mm. And then, you know, you were saying that, we, yes, we're working with the US. I mean, I'm dying to go back. <laughs> I'm part of the advisory board for the next real screen, which will take place uh, in Texas next year in Austin. You know, I, I think it'd be great to, to travel there and meet all our partners in the US as well. Yeah. Well, that was actually going to be my next question was where, where's your next market after MIPCOM? There's, there's Content London is on the agenda, obviously later this year and also Real Screen. Will you be at both of those events? I'm definitely contemplating going to Content London. In fact, I was asking people um, here yesterday and today, you know, uh, are you guys going? And from what I understand, a lot of people are going to be there. So that's great. And then usually there's a uh, the Congress happening in December. Um, the Science and, Congress. Yes, is, yeah. the, the World uh, Congress of Science and Factual. And um, it was going to be happening in Strasbourg. I think it's going to be mostly online with a few things mm. happening here and there. Um, so hopefully we can still be part of that as well. Um, and then definitely um, real screen. Well, Samuel, thank you for interrupting your busy schedule. Um, Thank you for having me here. Not at all. I guess I'll see you in uh, in Texas with a ten gallon hat on. Oh yeah, that's the reason why I'm leaving my. I'm. I, I keep my hair growing right now. I just want to be ready for Texas. That's Excellent. the only reason why. Excellent. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you for joining us. Good luck with the rest of MIPCOM, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Cheers. My next guest on this MIPCOM special show is Larry Bass. Boss of Chanel Will Productions in uh, in Dublin. Great to have you back on the show, Larry. Thanks, Justin. It's been a while. It feels like a whole lifetime. Here we are, actually meeting people again, and I'm sitting in front of you. Exactly in person, which is which is very pleasant. It's always great to see a friendly face. And uh, first of all, tell us how business is in Ireland now. How's how's the Irish industry come out the other end of COVID? Let's just hope. I'm touching some wood here that it is the end of COVID. But uh, how how are things over there? I think uh, on the COVID front, uh, like a lot of countries, we have as a nation fallen in love with the vaccine and just tracking 90% of the population uh, over 12 are fully vaccinated. Right. So I'd like to think that that will help us see out the other side of COVID, but, you know, it, it hasn't gone away. Um, production wise, I think the general production business is not quite back to full tilt, um, but is very busy. It's incredibly busy on the scripted side. I think that's a combination of um, so much pent up demand for content was built up over the pandemic, both in the UK, Ireland, US. So many shows need to get made. Ireland's a very attractive European base to make drama if you want to make it in English language. So um, we've had a, a remarkable few months as a result. Um, we've been given the gift of time by COVID. We never have had the time to develop. Um, so we spent all of our time in lockdown when we couldn't be in production. We turned our production team into quasi development people. We got some support from the government uh, in doing that. Um, we got further investment than by the Irish government through their export board, which allowed us really for the first time to be able to really dig deep into uh, development. That allowed us to develop a number of new scripts on our TV drama front. So our TV drama slate is very healthy. Thank you. And yeah. we're now out trying to find homes for all of it. Um, we also developed a couple of new non-scripted formats. Um, and again, because we had the time, we were able to get really deep into the structure of the shows. And two of those shows have been commissioned. One has been on air on RTE, Soundtrack to My Life. It's a show where musical um, singers or bands come in and it's like a This Is Your Life for a songster, except they tell their musical life and influences. Um, they pick the songs that have helped propel their career, whether it's their songs or other influences. Um, and it's all backed by a concert orchestra. 
So it's a right. beautiful entertainment show for Saturday night in RTE. Um, and we've featured acts like Coda Lyon, Johnny Logan, um, Celine Byrne is an opera singer. And, um, James. and you're selling that as a format? I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, first time out with it down here is just introducing it to people. It's an unusual show because it's full concert orchestra. Um, you don't usually see it in a, an entertainment show these days. No. Um, it's, it, it is a lifetime ago that most broadcasters had concert orchestras featuring on a lot of shows. Not anymore. So bringing them back into an entertainment show and sticking them with a rock and roll band and a Eurovision legend and a few other things like that. It's been really interesting. And then the host will take them through their musical career and find some interesting stories along the way. So it's a really nice show. Well, I guess that for bands, they don't get the opportunity of working with a concert orchestra and they're presumably playing together and interpreting some of their, their big hits and, their, and, and the songs through it that, that, that have influenced them, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the bands that like Codaline in our first show, they had to sit down with the musical director of the orchestra and actually work out the dots for the full orchestra. So that project alone for them to look into is like something they they wouldn't normally do. They probably would have arranged some strings on a recording session or, you know, maybe had other specials, but actually having to orchestrate, all, you know, a number of their tracks for a full orchestra. It's an amazing experience. And to be in the room for a recording, fantastic, really is. Right. Well, I wish you all the best with that. That sounds fantastic. That sounds so I'm some... still looking for a distributor, Justin. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, anybody listening, then, uh, and you're presumably, you say you're, you're obviously pitching that at MIPCOM. Here yep. we are. Uh, and we're pitching our other show that we developed called Last Singer Standing, which actually doesn't air on RT1 until October the 23rd. It's a new talent show. Um, and we've been the home of many talent shows over the years. We did Pop Stars, You're a Star, we did The Voice. So we know a thing or two about talent shows. So to be able to create our own original one, it's always exciting. Um, this is a talent show inside a game show. So it's a new Saturday night show for RTE One. We're delighted to have RTE work with us in developing the show. Um, Nikki Byrne from Westlife is the presenter. Uh, the pop superstar panel of judges are Dean Coyle from Girls Aloud, who first came to prominence when she was in Irish Pop Stars 20 years ago. Um, so it's full circle. Joey Fatone from NSYNC and Samantha Mumba. Um, and then we've got a whole array of fantastic new talent um, coming into studio in every show. And that whole series is pre-recorded. Um, we're delighted with the output. And again, I'm down here talking to potential distributors for a new Shiny Floor format. Right. And 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 they're both music based shows obviously um and i know you've got a big background in music uh uh tv in the past in ireland and and obviously uh adapting some of the world's biggest formats in ireland as well um is that the future for you then now developing more and more of your original formats and uh, and and seeing what's next on the f- music format um development if you like going forward yeah, we won't be just focusing on music. We will also work on fact end shows. Like we've done shows like MasterChef, The Apprentice, Dragon's Den. So, you know, we do want to, we've got a new business show we're working um, on. We hopefully will find a, a home for that show soon. Um, we've got a couple of other format ideas. So we're certainly doubling down on the development and further investment on original content. Um, we're still lucky enough to be um, in production. We're about to start pre-production on Dancing with the Stars, which did take a break because of COVID. But it's come back and hopefully it'll come back with a bang. That's been the biggest show in Ireland for a number of years. Um, we're still doing Banerjee's Home of the Year, which is a lovely fact end show, um, property show. It's now gone into its eighth season. So the non-scripted side, really busy. Um, on the scripted side, we've got a new series, which we hope to get into production um, mid next year, Clean Sweep, a co-production with Element 8 from Los Angeles um, and a bunch of other partners on that show. For, again, RT will be the Irish broadcaster and other broadcasters around the world pre-buying it. Um, we have a feature film um, co-production with Sepia Films in Canada going into production in February next year uh, with written by an Irish writer, Kieran Craig, and directed by a Canadian director, Vic Sarah, shot in west of Ireland, Donegal and Mayo. Thanks to the regional fund in Donegal and Mayo to facilitate that with Screen Ireland uh, support as well. And we have a second film, which we hope to um, get going in April next year, a co-production with a, a London-based company, Zephyr Films, 
um, on a script featuring talent like Maggie Smith, Kathy Bates, and Laura Denny. So it's the feature side is busy. Um, we have a feature documentary we're about to launch soon as well. Um, and I can safely say that we're probably healthier coming out of COVID than we were going in. Um, even though for a short few months, it was awful. It was terrible having to let go of so many talented people you worked with for many, many years. But thankfully, a lot of them are back with us and hopefully all the production people we would have worked with will be back working on the show with us soon. Well, I was going to ask you that, actually, in the sense of all of that forced development, if you like. You know, many producers, of particularly of scripted content, have, have gone through over the last 18 months. Do you expect in another year's time to not not quite be saying, you know, thank God for COVID, but, I mean, in terms of that focus that you've had to actually, you know, really, as you say, double down in development, and it sounds like it's it's going to be bearing fruit for you over the next year and hopefully in the future beyond that. I think it's it's hugely important, and the lesson is that you must treat development with much more reverence, actually invest more time, and obviously that means you're going to have to invest more resource. You can't do it fleetingly. I think too many people in busy production companies, development just gets left a little as the, you know, the poor cousin. Mm. And it should be front and center of the future of, of the business. And that's a, certainly something we will try and double down on. We've also added um, two other elements to the business. Because we got backed by Enterprise Ireland, who are basically our export board, we've hired um, a guy in Los Angeles to help connect us into um, both talent and um, production partnerships in the US for some of our ideas to um, pitch in the first instance in the US. When you're working in a small country like Ireland where you've really only got a couple of broadcasters to pitch to, sometimes the ideas either don't suit those broadcasters or you just know you're not going to be able to have um, this degree of success you need to sustain a growing business. So we're also now pitching in the States um, Chuck Labella is our um, employee over in LA. Um, his background is in um, talent. Um, so what he has done very successfully for us is connect us with good production partners, knowing the concept of the show, connecting them then with talent. He's got a black book of contacts you would not believe. And already through that connection, we've got a couple of shows in early stage uh, paid development with US networks. So that's a whole other new world for us. Um, and to facilitate the shooting of our new um, talent show and the forthcoming uh, series of Dance with the Stars and knowing as well how difficult it was to get into film studios, we've also um, opened up a new film studio, the first TV and film studio in Dublin City. We were the only capital city in the EU without a film studio. Um, there are studios in Ireland, but not in Dublin City. Right. So we've opened Font Hill Studios with another company. Um, it's not a Shinna Will studio. It's a separate business, but it's uh, something we we had to take the risk and jump in and invest and get it open because, frankly, there was just no space. Um, that's how busy uh, the scripted business is in Ireland. We can see that the all the news about you know uh, new studio complexes springing up all over the UK, and obviously that is is the same in many of the territories around Europe and, and wider afield just with the with the whole SVOD thirst for drama so uh, well good luck with that I'm sure that's uh, that's something that's going to be successful talking about MIPCOM we obviously had Samuel on the show a little bit earlier on mm. you're the second producer on the show now how are you finding MIPCOM as a producer because we don't there's not many Brits here Brit producers so is it an open goal for you I don't think anything is a slam dunk. You know, this is a business that you need to be absolutely consistent, persistent all the time, always. Um, it's been a little easier not having, ha you know, meetings on the half hour, fighting through 14,000 people, and there's only probably 4,000. So that makes it a little bit more bearable, considering we had such beautiful weather this week. Mm. Um, everyone is sat at home. They could be down here in the uh, sunny southeast of France. So from that point of view, we're doing business. I'm busy. And even Samuel, who, you know, I only met Samuel at Series Mania um, earlier this year. And I think by the fact that we decided we're going to go to these events, I know it's early doors. I know COVID hasn't gone away, but sometimes you got to risk it and 
get out there and do things and probably get ahead of the posse. Um, and through that, uh, going to Series Mania, we're actually talking to Samuel about a potential show. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a full believer that this is a people business and people do better business when you're face to face, when you can sit down and have a coffee, whether it's, um, you know, a, a, just a proper meeting, which great and all Zoom is. And I think Zoom's new role in the future, once we all get back to a, some sort of near normal, will be um, very helpful in secondary meetings and the ability to cut down on the sheer volume of um, trips you would have to do to complete a project. Um, but I think that first initial meeting when you, you want to pitch an idea, you want to meet a new co-producer, that's a face-to-face thing. It isn't going to go away. Um, you know, this business is built of people who want to work with people who they get on with, people that they, they can have a glass of rosé with or a pint of Guinness with um, and, you know, want to do that again and again and again because this is a tough business. And uh, I think you can build relationships to a degree on the phone or on a, a laptop, um, but really it, it requires that face-to-face to complete it. And it's trust, isn't it? It's uh, I think trust is a big part of it. It's obviously communication, but also we're talking about projects that involve lots and lots of people and a lots and lots of money as well in many cases, particularly in scripted. So you've got to trust your partners. Well, you've got to get to know people. You know, uh, I know things aren't going too well for Leeds United this year, Justin. West Ham are actually doing okay, but you know, we, you and I wouldn't get to talk about as much football if we didn't see each other from time to time. This is very true. And I'm going to pick that up offline actually with you later on. We're <laughs> going to have a pint of Guinness because it is nearly uh, Guinness o'clock as yeah. we, as we speak and we record this. So uh, I'll look forward to that, Larry. Listen, thank you for coming on the show. It's gr- lovely to see you again. All the best with the rest of your meetings. Thanks a million, Justin. Good luck at all. So here we are at the end of our MIPCOM special show, and who better to talk to us a little bit about how MIPCOM was, was Lucy Smith again, welcoming Lucy back on the show. How are you, Lucy? A little tired, but absolutely thrilled and exhilarated to have uh, managed to get back to Cannes and uh, to have put MIPCOM on. Yeah, well, congratulations on pulling it off. There didn't seem to be any shortage of buyers because I think that was one of the things that people were maybe talking about before the market, how many people are going to be here, um, how many exhibitors, how many buyers. Can you just give us a bit of a rundown on some of the key stats? Yeah, of course. Um, We've had around 4,500 participants, um, including 1,200 buyers, 145 stands uh, from 38 countries, 14 national pavilions, Um, So there's really been a great audience for people to have a lot of very good and busy schedules um, and a lot of meetings. Yeah, well that's what I've I've been picking up from people. The people that have actually been here have had no shortage of meetings and it's probably not a surprise when you you think about those numbers, that's almost a quarter of the attendees were biased, right? So uh, so that's that's pretty impressive. What about MIP TV? What's going to be happening uh, next year? Okay, well, MIP TV, um, we're already working on that and talking to all of our clients about it. We'll take place from the 4th to the 6th of April. We have, we're going to actually deliver on that transformation that we were initiated in 2020 before we had to cancel. Um, so we will be delivering a three-day business-efficient market. So it used to be a four-day market preceded by a weekend, which had MIP doc and MIP formats. So we've decided to bring all of that together under one roof over three days in the Palais. Um, We are also having Can Series back to its normal um, annual venue. So it's usually in April, isn't it? Is that right? That's correct. It's usually in April. Due to the pandemic, it moved to MIPCOM, and especially this year because it actually happened in person. Um, So Can Series will take place alongside MIP TV. Um, and also our show Esports Bar, so Esports Business Arena, which I know you've talked about a bit on That's your right. shows recently. Um, we will be co-locating that alongside MIP TV and looking to develop more of those synergies between the two industries. Obviously, we know it's a smaller market, but it did feel that I've heard that a lot of people using the word energy. You know, the, the people had a lot of meetings and, and they the, it was lovely to you know to sit in the sun and chat to people and, and meet people and bump into people and uh, bump into, into people at the bars and and that's where those business opportunities do 
come from, right? It's not necessarily yeah. the half-hour meetings, or, or some people have been having longer meetings mm. here, but it is about seeing somebody over the bar and go, oh, it's those guys. And then it's, it's, it just seems to... I don't know, there seemed to be a bit of pent-up energy around that, so it was yeah. lovely to see that. No, I agree, and I think that's something we've always talked about, is those serendipitous moments of just like running into someone and then suddenly um, sharing an experience and meeting a new potential business contact. And I do also agree that, you know, it's not only been about those 30-minute meetings, you know, there's been a lot of them, but it's been about spending a bit more time. It's been about, you know, you've, we, we've been seeing a lot more about people talking about, you know, reconnecting, celebrating, and it's the joy of being back and knowing that we can actually keep on doing these shows. Yeah. And we do it a little differently, but we've got the sunshine of Cannes as well. We've been absolutely spoilt by that. So there's been a lot, as you said, <laughs> just in a lot of people out on the terraces yeah. and enjoying... A few late nights as well. It. I know, the... I know, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Well, Lucy, thing, Lucy right? congratulations on pulling the shelf. It was, uh, you know, it was a really enjoyable event, and uh, we'll see you for MIT TV next year. We certainly will. Thank you, Justin, for being here and having done a telecast from MIPCOM in Cannes. Well, that's about it for this week's MIPCOM special show. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope you enjoyed a little snapshot from the world's biggest content market as the TV industry gets together in person once again. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And a quick reminder to sign up for our free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed, downloadable reports and surveys, and exclusive insight and opinion. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in Cannes. Until next Thursday, as always, stay safe.